Um, welcome, everyone. This is the inaugural Physical Genomics Predoctoral Training Program Quarterly Seminar. So uh, it's our, our first crack at this. And um, again, this is a, a brand new training program that started in September. Um, today, uh, our speaker will be Vadim Bachman, who is the director of the program. And uh, he'll go over um, some of the exciting uh, developments in physical genomics. And then moving forward, uh, we hope to have students and faculty recommend uh, you know, physical genomics uh, investigators to come and give talks and interact with the, the students to kind of give them opportunities to network with uh, scientists in the physical, physical genomics um, field. So uh, just as kind of a, an introductory to the program, I thought I'd give a real brief uh, introduction uh, before uh, turning, um, turning it over to Vadim and just kind of introduce the program and highlight our inaugural class of students. So um, there we go. So the PGTP administration is Vadim Pachman. He's the uh, speaker for today and the director of the program. I'm James Peterson. I am the program administrator and the senior director of operations and outreach uh, of the Center for Physical Genomics and Engineering, which is uh, Vadim's center as well. And then Ben Keene is the Senior Program Administrator of the Center for Physical Genomics and uh, Engineering and the Program Coordinator for the PGTP. Uh, the mission of the PGTP is to train the next generation of transdisciplinary scientists that uh, will bridge molecular biology, bioengineering, physics, optics, chemistry, and medicine. So we really want to kind of uh, empower the students uh, with sort of a transdisciplinary uh, you know, capability of discussion <laughs> across many diff different uh, disciplines. Uh, and physical genomics, uh, you know, the dean's going to kind of go into this a little bit uh, further. I just thought it kind of, you might even use the same slide, <laughs> but it's a new field that aims to understand uh, from the first principles of physics, the in interrelation between the structure and function of the genome and the role in generating global patterns of gene expression. So that's just kind of uh, uh, just a brief introduction of what physical genomics is. The PGTP has, you know, 38 mentors from three schools and 17 different departments. So it's, again, trying our best to be transdisciplinary. And um, we're continuing to kind of move uh, 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 mentors in and out of the program. And we hope to attract as many as we possibly can. Uh, there are seven different PhD programs that uh, sort of feed in that are uh, eligible for our, our program. And uh, uh, the students kind of represent, uh, um, I think, from three or four different programs currently. So the features of the PGTV are sort of a transdisciplinary coursework. There are required uh, coursework um, in systems uh, biology, the principle and methods of system biology, because this is an NIH, uh, NIGMS systems and integrated biology training grant. So system biology is a, is a required uh, coursework, there's quantitative biology, there's uh, optical uh, microscopy and imaging, and computational ge genomics that are required courseworks. Uh, the students all have cross-disciplinary mentors. Their, um, their, their main mentor is in one of the, uh, is either in engineering, physics, chemistry, and then they have a co-mentor in uh, another uh, life sciences. So they're either main PhD mentors in life sciences and they have a core mentor from engineering, physics, or chemistry, or their PhD mentor is in one of those and has a co-mentor in the other sort of transdisciplinary discipline. Uh, they will spend six weeks uh, in their co-mentor's lab over the course of their training. It might be, uh, it could be split up three weeks and three weeks or uh, a whole six weeks, but this really gives them an opportunity to immerse themselves in uh, a, a different discipline. Uh, they, we also have a monthly student research forum that's gotten off to a great start where students will come and, and give talks on their research and uh, really help uh, all the students of the program understand uh, the different disciplines that they're coming from. And we have skill workshops and research seminars just like this, this quarterly um, you know, seminar that we'll hold. The annual symposium on physical genomics this year it will be April 22nd. I will send out a, a reminder, but it'll be a full day of talks on physical genomics uh, with uh, scientists from all over the country that'll come and give talks and uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to network with them during, uh, during that day of talks. 
There's career development training opportunities. Uh, we have a summer research opportunity program. Uh, we're hoping to have it again this year where students will have uh, an opportunity to uh, engage and work with undergraduates from, uh, from Northeastern Illinois University, as well as some other uh, schools from across the country, but it's uh, aimed at uh, recruit, recruitment of underrepresented minorities to Northwestern. And then we also have communication, outreach, education, and a knowledge transfer program. So our inaugural class was six students. Uh, we're hoping that maybe we'll get eight more, uh, eight more slots next year. So uh, this year we had Lucas Carter, who's an, uh, an IBA student. He's a G2. He's a PhD advisor is the Dean. His co-mentor is uh, Marcello Bonini uh, in uh, Medicine Hemat. Uh, the project title is Deconvoluting the Epistatic Relations Between Chromatin Modelers and Their Impact on Genome Architecture. Uh, the second student is Raymond Fang. Uh, he's an MSTP uh, student and in the BME department. He's a G2. Uh, he's, his PhD advisor is Hao Zhang, and his co-mentor is uh, Samu Kume. <laughs> I must, I must be, he, who is a pre professor of medicine and cardiology. And his title is, or his project is Understanding the Influence of Altered Gene Expression or the Pathology of Aqueous Outflow in the Eye. Uh, Joran Graham is our third student. He's a physics uh, PhD student, uh, G3. His advisor is Adelson Motter, and his co mentor is John Marco in Molecular Biosciences. And his uh, project title is Manipulating Chromatin Confirmation Through Combinatorial Perturbations Guided by Machine Learning. Uh, Sam uh, Hamilton is a DGP student uh, who's a G3 in Deborah Winter's lab, who's a professor in medicine and rheumatology, and uh, his co-mentor is Vadim. And his project is leveraging 3D chromatin information as an advanced predictor of pneumonia treatment response. Sophia Lampers is also a DGP student, a G2 in Jindan Yu's uh, lab, uh, who's in uh, medicine, Himak, and her co-mentor is Ji Ji, who's uh, in biomedical engineering, and her title is, uh, her project is the E3 ligase trim 25 is a key regulatory regulator of prostate cancer metastasis. And Sarah Radecki is a DGP student, uh, in the G4 in Gail Wolschak's lab, uh, she's a professor of radi radiation oncology and uh, the so associate dean of graduate students in postdoctoral affairs. Is, is she still that? <laughs> I don't know if she moved out of that yet. <laughs> but uh, um, we should hopefully free up some of her time when she's done with that. And then her co mentor is also the dean. And uh, her project title is Investigating the Effects of Nanocomposite Treatment on Chromatin Structure in Irradiated Human Cancer. So that's those are our six brand new students. Uh, we're, we're doing a, a, you know, we're having a, a good time uh, kind of uh, settling into the program. Uh, anyone that's interested, you can go to the Center for Physical Genomics and Engineering website under the education tab and look up the physical genomics training program. Uh, the application is gonna open in March. We make decisions in August about, um, uh, the application closes at the end of July and then make decisions in August about next year's class. So uh, does anyone have any questions about the program before I go ahead and turn it over to the Dean? You can go ahead and, oh. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. I see it took another, another three years. Wow. <laughs> That's fabulous. Uh, uh, if, uh, if no one has uh, any questions, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, turn uh, the presentation over to the Dean. One second, for some reason, uh, 
the screen share did not work the first time. Just give me one second. Okay, try again. Sorry about that. <laughs> No problem at all, man. I'm trying to turn off the subtitles, but I have a hard time doing that. Hmm. Were, were, were those going for all mine? <laughs> um, so I, I, yeah, I, I was teaching a class, uh, and the, one of the students requested subtitles. Uh, not subtitles. This is the. Um, uh, closed captions, sorry, closed yeah. captions. And then I'm trying to figure out how, how to turn them off because they're a little annoying, uh, but okay. All right, I'll, 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 I'll figure it out one way or the other. Oh yeah, here we go. No. All right, let's just go ahead. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. I'll, I'll need to get a uh, crash course on how to use PowerPoint. I didn't even know that you could do uh, closed captions in PowerPoint. So I, um, you know, I have a nine-year-old son. So what we what we do now is we read Harry Potter's books and uh, then try to watch a movie uh, one at a time. And it's getting really scary at like book number four, I guess. So we'll see how that's going to turn out. But the reason I'm showing the picture of Harry Potter with his wand is because in many ways, that's what reductionist biology really is. Um, it works like, like magic. Now, I don't mean this in a negative context. Uh, the reductionist biology has opened up incredible amount of frontiers uh, we're all benefiting from. However, one interesting aspect about the reductionist aspect in biology is that it's hard to get into understanding of why things actually work the way they do. In the end of the day, all biological systems have to obey the laws of physics, but it's hard really to understand how these laws actually operate because the way we understand most of biology today is by using magic wands. What I mean by that? Whenever we read a paper that says that a particular pathway activates, let's say, works through with a particular target, let's say, or one pathway activates expression of one gene or another, we don't really get into the details what actually happens, how these proteins do what they do, how this pathway actually works. We know when you pull a string like you move the wand, an outcome is going to happen. Their outcome is going to be predictable and you know exactly which string to pull, but it still doesn't answer the question, what actually happens in between? And in part because of that, if we look at a process of, for example, drug development, until today, many a time after a target is discovered, a pharmaceutical company has to go through thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of compounds, figuring out which one may be a hit and which one may, might work uh, as, a, as a drug. We don't do this in engineering. When we want to build a house, architects don't build 10,000 houses and then see which ones are gonna stand and pick one that actually survives uh, for longer than a few days. We know exactly how the laws of gravity and the last of laws of mechanics work, and we can build a house that is stable nearly every time. We are not exactly there uh, in reductionist biology, in part because we still don't understand all the details of how the systems, biological systems operate. And make no mistake, there's a good reason for this. Biological systems are much more complex than what more traditional engineering, electrical engineering or mechanical engineering 
have to deal with on a regular basis. There's a very good reason for this. A few processes are more complex than uh, the process of gene expression. So not that long time ago, the thinking had been that all we have to do is to understand uh, the genetic code. We have to sequence the genome and then we will be able to treat, we'll be able to treat all kinds of diseases. I remember uh, an NIH director back in early nineties made a speech about that. And at the time the thinking was that all we have to do is to figure out the function of P53 in cancer and the cancer will be cured in literally the next few years. And now we know that we were a little too naive about it. And part of the reason is because of much deeper understanding of epigenetic regulation of gene expression. So it's not just about the linear sequence of the genome, it's about uh, epigenetic regulation, which genes get expressed, which genes don't get expressed. But the story is a little more complicated than that. About 10 or so years ago, we began to understand that the gen genome is folded into a fairly complicated pattern in three-dimensional space. It has all kinds of supranucleosomal structures that in turn regulate, if not necessarily the function of individual genes, but certainly global transcriptional patterns. Here is another analogy. If you take the genome from a single cell and magnify it 1 million times, it will turn into a Chinese noodle about two millimeters in diameter, which will stretch all the way from the city of Chicago to Dallas. Then you take this noodle and you pack it within a, uh, a single room. And that's how the cell nucleus is gonna look like. Now we know that depending on how this noodle is packed, how it's interconnected, which genes get close to each other versus far away, the genome function is gonna be different. In essence, if the linear sequence of DNA is genetic genomic hardware, uh, chromatin is the software. And we can, when we think about software, we can talk, think about two types of software. I have my cell phone here next to me. It's little apps that run on a cell phone. And I think I have too many of them. Actually, I need to delete a bunch of them. Or well, maybe I should throw away the whole cell phone. I don't know. I, I'll think about that. Uh, but at any rate, so the, these individual apps, this is the epigenetic code. But the, a higher level of organization is akin to an operating system that works on the cell phone. And historically, we were, used to be able to make hardware before we understood the software. And only now we're beginning to understand the cell's operating system. The engineering of the genome kind of paralleled the process of our understanding. After all, gene editing and CRISPR came before uh, epigenetic uh, engineering, we're still fairly much in the infancy of devising uh, uh, therapeutic compounds that can work uh, at, the level, uh, at the epigenetic level. And, and the process of understanding how to do chromatin engineering and to regulate uh, the whole structure of the genome is still very much in its infancy. But the point I would like to make today is that we are actually on a very fast trajectory to begin to understand how to rewrite software of the cells and how to rewrite or reprogram the operating system. And this can be achieved through convergence of physical and biomolecular science, sciences. That's where, where the field of physical genomics or fields gen for short uh, comes in. As James mentioned, the goal of physical genomics is to bridge physics and biology together and understand gene expression as a physical system and understand how it can be regulated uh, through the principles of physics. We couldn't possibly have this discipline 
emerging even 20 years ago, perhaps not even 10. And there's a reason for this. It's highly technology development. In fact, there are three critical technologies, the three horsemen of progress in physical genomics that uh, you know, I would call them, uh, that really drive the discovery, discoveries in this field. The first technology is nanoscale imaging, especially imaging of the genome. When we talk about the structure, and three-dimensional organization of the genome and how those processes affect gene expression, we have to see the structure. We have to be able to image and understand where molecular regulators are in the context of, um, of the genome structure. We have to have a map of our genomic city. This length scales are nanoscale. The size of DNA is Two nanometers in diameter. The size of higher, uh, the size of a uh, nucleosome is about 10. This is the length scales we, we have to assess. Nobel Prize in 2014 was awarded for the development of super optical super resolution microscopy. And it is this technology that what played a has been playing a critical role in the in our understanding of the structure of the genome. Genome mapping. Technologies such as high c or 3C began to play a critical role in the past decade as well. For the first time, we can actually say whether uh, two genes are in proximity to one another. And we are beginning to understand the enormous complexity of looping in other processes that regulate three-dimensional structure of the genome. Molecular modeling is another big pillar, is another third horseman here of progress. It is extremely hard, or nearly impossible, I would say, to affect an aspect of a biological system without changing anything else. You can't really turn genes on and off or shut down a protein without affecting some other function that this gene or protein might have. This is the problem with the complex systems, which is what biology is. However, in silico, in a computer. We can harness the power of supercomputing today and model transcriptional processes pretty much from the atomistic details, or at least we are getting there. And so for the first time, we can model gene expression, we can model gene transcription in the computer with a very high degree of accuracy and level of control. The combination of genome mapping, nanoscale imaging, and molecular modeling combined with AI and supercomputing, these are the drivers, technological drivers of the progress in physical genomics. And we can use, take advantage of this technological platform to begin to ask questions in physical molecular biology. Again, trying to understand gene expression processes from principles of physics, eventually leading to the field of chromatin engineering, our ability to develop technologies which can regulate genome structure and regulate gene expression at the, again, at the uh, physical level. Some of the critical questions that the field still has to address is, well, one is obvious, how the genome is actually organized. What is, what is the chromatin structure? And what are the factors? What are the processes, molecular regulators and physical regulators that drive chromatin structure? What is the role of chromatin structure in gene expression? And how this escalates all the way to complicated multi-genomic, uh, multi-parametric uh, transcriptional states, eventually leading to a control of the phenotype. And then those fundamental questions can lead to vital translational applications. One uh, aspect that we are working on in, in my lab is related to cancer diagnostics in collaboration with several people who are here today and who, have, who are, are now serving as mentors in this uh, physical genomics training program. One of those questions is whether we can uh, uh, re-engineer or affect 
three-dimensional chromatin structure in such a way that cancer cells lose their ability to be transcriptionally plastic. And that, as the result, might be easier to kill using other therapeutic strategies. But this is just one example. There are many others. In turn, these translational questions bring back uh, the need to develop new technologies and, again, revise the fundamental questions. And so this is kind of a vicious, good vicious cycle of, of, of progress. Indeed, we are beginning to see very fine details of the genome structure. A lot of this research is done here at Northwestern, including the work of Binayik uh, Dravid and Hao Zhang. Now we can actually see where chromatin is and how it's organized at a very fine level as what you can see here. For the first time, we can generate images like this one, where we see location of nucleosomes and linker DNA in 3D um, with a remarkable level of detail. Molecular simulations, such as molecular dynamics or molecular theory, are beginning to allow us to model how gene expression happens again at the physical uh, atomistic level. And then using the power of supercomputing and the, uh, the work uh, of phenomenal scientists here at Northwestern, such as uh, Egal uh, Slifer, uh, these processes can be considered across the whole genome. We're not there yet, but that's where the uh, science is going. And those understanding of those processes has been leading to us asking questions of how we can actually affect them and change genome structure in a predictable way for a variety of therapeutic applications. For example, the work of uh, Marcelo Benini or Daniela Matei or Mazar Adli here at Northwestern at Feinberg uh, has been focusing on uh, re regulating regulation of genome structure for cancer therapeutics, but it's not the only application, although it is a powerful one. Um, in collaboration with uh, Guillermo Amir, who directs uh, Center for uh, Advanced Regenerative Engineering, researchers are beginning to understand how mechanical cues exerted on uh, stem cells can be leveraged in order to faster differentiate those cells into uh, fibroblasts or other types of cells, uh, bone cells, for example, uh, in order to regenerate tissue such as bone. Bone is probably going to be the first uh, tissue organ that is going to be easy, easier to regenerate, but there is really no reason to stop there. Uh, I think physical genomics will help us understand how we can regenerate the heart tissue uh, and other other organs in the body. Um, and if we escalate the same processes all the way to the, the whole organisms, research here at Northwestern uh, in collaboration with the uh, civil and environmental engineering faculty, Luisa Marcelino, uh, aims at reprogramming uh, cells of the whole organism, coral reefs that are under enormous pressure from, from climate change and uh, on the way to the extinction, unless we can find a way to genetically and epigenetically uh, fasten the evolution and uh, create super corals, so to speak, that can withstand much higher temperatures uh, in the ocean without damage. And so, the way I see it, the application of physical genomics is grounded in technology, fundamental biological questions, and translation with the implications uh, for regulating systems all the way from as simple as a single gene to whole organisms. There are a few examples that I mentioned of you know, research that is conducted here at Northwestern, including cancer diagnostics and therapeutics, uh, but also organ regeneration and uh, reprogramming of cells uh, to be more resilient to 
uh, injury, such as ischemic injury. But there is no need to stop there. What if we can reprogram uh, cells such as uh, smooth muscle cells or endothelial cells or inflammatory cells uh, in order to withdraw from the vicious cycle of atherosclerosis? Can we improve the longevity by altering and eliminating senescent cells? We don't know answers to those questions, but we certainly have a phenomenal group of people here at Northwestern who are beginning to address uh, this very exciting issues. If there's one word that I will leave you today with, it's convergence. Convergence goes beyond just interdisciplinary research, which in itself, of course, is extremely powerful. We're talking about teaching and training the next generation of leaders in science who not able, not just able to cross the aisle and uh, communi communicate uh, and create projects with their fellows from other fields, but new scientists who can speak multiple languages, for example, biology, engineering, and physics and data science all at the same time, and can create completely new concepts at the intersection or convergence of those fields. And that is an extremely exciting place to be. In fact, I would say that for young, especially young people who are here today and who are getting trained in those fields, I think there is no better time in the history of biological sciences uh, and biomedical engineering than it is today. I think actually, I'm quite optimistic that within our lifetime, we'll begin to see uh, some of the major diseases of the 20th century and 21st centuries being addressed. It is a really exciting time to be where you are. So just congratulations and enjoy the ride. Thank you. Well, that's great, Nadeem, I really appreciate it. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Well, really nice overview of physical genomics and the power it promises. So, uh, all right. Well, uh, if there aren't any questions, uh, we can. Uh, you can have the quiz and... now, James. Uh, I'm sorry? You can have the quiz. There are no questions that they should have a quiz. Okay. <laughs> That's right. All right. I'm sending the quiz out via email. <laughs> uh, let me just maybe say that uh, again to students here on the uh, in this meeting, uh, you're like double, triple lucky. I mean, I think you have a perfect time to be trained uh, in convergent science, but also you came to a very right place. Uh, there are very few places in the world that you can take advantage of such fantastic people as we have, you know, here. And, and again, many of them are here on, on this call. Like I see Marcelo Bonini's, you know, doing phenomenal, very exciting research in, um, in, in answer, uh, Igor Efimov, who is uh, a internationally recognized leader in uh, cardiovascular engineering, very, very exciting work. Uh, and those of us who work on imaging, such as I, I, I see a picture of Binayak, I, it's a big picture on my screen. Uh, but this, uh, you know, these are the kind of imaging technologies uh, that will really usher the new way of looking, uh, you know, and that's, and, and that's the future. So you are, you're very lucky. Uh, we have phenomenal, uh, group of people, faculty here at Western working in computational genomics, again, which is critical. Uh, Joe G, for, for example, uh, uh, Donald Dahl is on the call, Egal Slifer. Uh, but Northwestern, I think, is the best place, again, in the world to do molecular modeling of those transcriptional processes in particular uh, because of, uh, because of uh, Dahl's work. So, it's, it's a really an incredible place where convergence of convergence is really happening. And when you, when you have this fantastic people or 
uh, internationally recognized leaders in their fields. They do great research. They want to work together. They want to understand each other. We all want to speak multiple languages. Uh, and, and those are also very nice, you know, very good people to work with, which is not always the case, as we just saw the story, Eric Lander, right, uh, who was fired from, uh, from the White House uh, committee. Uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of cases when you may have a brilliant scientist, uh, not very easy to work with, and that's really not the case. The culture here in Northwestern is completely different. I wish every place were like that. It's, it's, it's a very friendly environment. So, uh, you know, I'm just, I guess my message to students is like, you're double or triple lucky. <laughs> the right time, the right place, the right people. You know, I wish I were in your shoes. I wish I were about like 20 years younger. <laughs> well, anyway, I just wanted to add a very quick comment that, you know, there's often, I think Richard Feynman used to say, what I don't see, I don't understand. And so here we have the ability to see the genome, the structure, the architecture at across multiple length scale. And I think to be able to see it, we hope we will be able to understand it. So thanks Same. for being a part of this. I'm just very happy to work with, uh, uh, with some of you. So it's, um, it's just, it's a privilege. It's really a privilege. And you're right, seeing is believing, yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, and we hope that the program, uh, you know, really kind of uh, helps establish more collaborations across, you know, the dif different disciplines. So that's uh, uh, that I really Ooh. hope that we get to reach more and more faculty and bring them into this exciting new field. Yeah, I just would like to say that the, the program has always been one of the major attractives to me, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Since before I joined Northwestern, I was eyeing the program, and it's super special to be in the program. So thank you. That's great. Thank you. So. All right. Well, thank you all so very much. Everyone, uh, you all have a great day, and I'll be talking with the students shortly enough. Wonderful. Thank you, James, for organizing that. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you, James.